I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live, another mass shooting in America. At least five people are dead in Raleigh, North Carolina, including an off-duty police officer. A suspect is now in custody and in critical condition, what police are saying about the victims. Former President Trump is responding to the January 6th committee after it voted to subpoena him to answer questions under oath. The committee's presumed final hearing focused on the president's or former president's actions surrounding the Capitol riot and showed stunning new video from that day. Now, what comes next in the investigation? And inflation nears historic highs with everything from food, fuel, and home prices soaring. How the White House is responding and when people might see some relief as Social Security recipients get some good news. But we begin with yet another mass shooting in the United States. Five people are dead, including an off-duty police officer, after a gunman opened fire near a nature trail in Raleigh, North Carolina. A suspect is in custody with life-threatening injuries after what police describe as a long standoff. Owen Lopez is on the scene in Raleigh with more on this. Owen, the police chief said this morning that the crime scene spans over two miles. Walk us through what we know at this point about the suspect and how this happened. Yeah, Diane, police are still combing through this area looking for evidence in what is expected to be an extensive investigation. Police are simply describing the suspect as a 15 year old white male. They have not identified him by name. They say that the shooting started on the streets then that suspect fled into the trails that we were talking about earlier. They say that the age range of those deceased is between 16 years old and 52. The suspect is just 15 years old and is in critical condition. We know that he sustains life-threatening injuries at this moment. It is unclear at this point whether those injuries were self-inflicted or not. We are hoping to learn more from police about that. And regarding that off-duty officer, he was one of those five killed, just 29 years old, and was on his way to work, according to police, when he was shot and killed. Diane. Ellen Lopez, thank you. And former President Trump is now responding after the January 6th committee ended their presumed final hearing Thursday with a bombshell subpoena for the former president. Trump is calling the entire committee hearing a show trial and a witch hunt. The committee voted unanimously, hoping to question the former president under oath about his actions leading up to the 2020 election, as well as the Capitol riots. Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has the latest. In a direct challenge to Donald Trump, the January 6th committee voted to subpoena him to answer questions under oath about his actions on and before the day his supporters attacked the U.S. Capitol. We are obligated to seek answers directly from the man who set this all in motion. The move came just after the committee presented riveting new video from January 6th. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi showed fleeing the mob that was already inside the Capitol building, whisked to a secure location with the other congressional leaders. We have got to get to finish the proceedings. Or else going to have to come Did we go back into session? We did go back into session, but now apparently everybody on the floor is putting on tear gas masks to prepare for a breach. Raw footage was shot by Pelosi's daughter, filmmaker Alexandra Pelosi, an incredible window into this moment of history as lawmakers called Trump administration officials to plead for help. Yeah, why don't you get the president to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General, and your law enforcement responsibility? Republican congressional leaders, including Mitch McConnell and Steve Scalise, are there too, as Pelosi calls Vice President Mike Pence, who had been evacuated to an underground loading dock beneath the Capitol. We're trying to figure out how we can get this job done today. The overriding wish is to do it at the Capitol. Later, Pence is heard on speakerphone, giving Pelosi an update. Congress could soon reconvene to certify the presidential election. Your Sergeant in arms will inform you that their best information is that they believe that uh, the House and the Senate will be able uh, to reconvene in roughly an hour. Vice Chair Liz Cheney made the committee's closing argument that Donald Trump, above all, was responsible for what happened. None of this would have happened without him. Trump said he would have a response this morning to the subpoena. He did put out a lengthy written statement 
It's a statement that complains about the January 6th committee, calls it a witch hunt. It even complains that not enough attention has been paid to the size of the crowd that turned out on January 6th. But nowhere in this statement does he answer the question. He doesn't say whether or not he will comply with the subpoena. Diane? All right, John Carl, thanks for that. And President Biden is in California, where he's set to give remarks today on lowering costs for American families. The president is trying to make the case that if Republicans win control of Congress in the midterm elections, inflation is going to get worse. Inflation in the economy in general has been shown to be a top issue for voters and a challenge for Democrats. Meanwhile, the Social Security Administration is set to increase benefits for millions of Americans to help deal with rising prices. I want to bring in business reporter Alexis Christophorus in now for a little bit more on all this. Alexis, what does this Social Security benefit bump mean for retirees? Well, hopefully it's going to mean some much-needed relief for the nearly 70 million Social Security recipients. They've seen their budgets stretch thin because of high inflation. Also, their nest eggs have taken a real wallop because of the plunging stock and bond markets. So the average monthly Social Security check will rise by 8.7% next year, the biggest cost of living adjustment since 1981. That means people are going to see their uh, Social Security checks go up by $146 a month. Certainly good news. And, and get this statistic that I read. 20% of retirees depend on Social Security for 90% or more of their income. So the fact that they're going to be getting more in that check every month is welcome news. So where does this leave Social Security as a program? Will it run out of money eventually? That's a myth. Uh, a lot of people are saying that is going to happen. It won't bankrupt Social Security, but it will definitely put a stress on the system, and it's estimated by 2034, that's just 12 years away, Social Security will only be able to pay out 80% of its benefits unless Congress acts. And I feel like Social Security has been on Congress's to-do list forever. Yeah, and as they, long as I can remember. They need to start to make some real changes. Um, let's talk inflation. We're looking at near historic eyes. Where are people feeling it the most right now? So let's just talk about where inflation is at the moment, up 8.2% year over year. Our wages are only up 5%, so clearly not keeping pace. And we took a look at some everyday items. Right now, it costs the average household $445 more a month to pay for things like rent, medical care, daycare expenses. When it comes to food, which is a big part of the inflation picture, there, we've got dairy products and coffee, each up better than 15%. Going to cost you 17% more for chicken. And look at eggs, up 37%. Of course, housing, a big part of the inflation picture as well, whether you rent or you buy. So a one-bedroom apartment averaged about $1,200 last year. Today, that's $500 more. And if you're buying, you're still getting hit, Diane. Mortgage rates are now at a 16-year high. And gas prices, remember they had been coming down. Mm. We were enjoying that a little bit. They're creeping back up now with OPEC going to cut production. The national average now, 390 a gallon. Of course, a whole lot more in California. And not to continue to be the bearer of bad news, <laughs> but home heating going to cost us all more to heat our homes, whether it's with natural gas, electricity, home heating oil, it's going to be more. One more cost going up. Now, we've seen over and over again that the economy and inflation um, are top issues for voters in the midterms. The president's in California today, among other things, saying that if Republicans gain control of Congress, they will repeal the Inflation Reduction Act. All of this gets worse. What say you to that? I say that we've been talking about how the Inflation Reduction Act is a misnomer because it doesn't have much to do with inflation. Over time, it should bring down uh, health care costs and energy costs. This is a, a many years process. It's not going to do anything for inflation in the short term. And the Fed and interest rates, what are you watching for there? We're watching for any relief on the inflation front. Doesn't look like we're going to get it anytime soon. So the Fed probably going to raise interest rates by another three quarters of a percent at that November meeting. Probably going to get another uh, hike in December, which means borrowing costs, everything from mortgages to um, home equity loans to your credit cards. All those interest rates are going up. So if you can start to bring down debt now, pay it off because it's only going to get more expensive. All right. Alexis Christophorus, always great to have you. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up, Vladimir Putin sets a deadline for the Russian draft, what it could mean for the war in Ukraine. We're live in Kyiv when we come back.
Welcome back. Vladimir Putin says mobilization of army reservists he ordered will be completed in two weeks. The call-up announced by Putin in September has proved hugely unpopular in Russia, where almost all men under the age of 65 are registered as reservists. ABC News' Britt Klenet is live from the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv for us on this. Britt, Putin initially described this mobilization as partial and said only those with combat or service experience would be drafted. Is that how it's played out? He did, Diane. You know, we all remember Russia saying 300,000 reservists would get the call up. Now, around 220,000 of them have been mobilized. 33,000 are already said to be in military units, and around 16,000 of them are involved in the fighting in Ukraine. So, yeah, Diane, that's a lot of extra involvement and manpower for a partial mobilization. And we know many of these guys don't even have any combat experience. But at a press conference in Kazakhstan, Putin now says there are no plans for further mobilization. He says it will be over in two weeks. But we saw the protests in Russia held after his announcement, which marked the biggest backlash to Putin's war since it began. So he has to tread carefully. You know, he needs that support at home, which is why the propaganda and winning the information war at home is so, so important to Putin. Now, the first deaths of newly mobilized Russian troops in Ukraine have been reported in Russian media. That's sparking criticism of the military command. Is Russia, is Russia making any progress? Well, look, UK intelligence says Russia is rapidly exhausting its supply of long-range munitions. So this is a massive blow. It says that it's not a campaign that it's able to sustain indefinitely. And it goes on to say that Ukrainians, on the other hand, are proving they were able to shoot down a significant portion uh, of Russian missiles on Monday. You know, we saw more than 80 aimed at Ukraine, and, and Ukrainian defence were able to intercept about half of them. But Russia also facing setbacks, as we know, in the south and in the east. You know, the Russian-installed governor of Hassan has now told residents there to take their children and to flee. And meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron has been criticized by opponents for saying that the country would evidently not use nuclear weapons in response to a nuclear attack on Ukraine. What can you tell us about that? So he was speaking with French domestic TV and he said something like, you know, our doctrine rests on the fundamental interests of the nation, saying that those interests wouldn't change if there was a nuclear attack on Ukraine. That has created this, this uproar at home from certain sectors, including from former President Francois Hollande, uh, MPs and, and think tanks in the country have also been critical, many saying it would have been best if he had said nothing at all. That's the whole point of nuclear deterrence. Not a huge surprise coming from Macron, though. He has taken a softer stance compared with other Western leaders, you know, pushing for negotiations and at one point even warning against humiliating Putin. Diane? All right, Britt Clenet live from Kiev for us. Britt, stay safe. Thank you. And the jury foreman is now speaking out after the Parkland school shooter was spared the death penalty. The jury recommended the gunman who killed 17 people instead be sentenced to life in prison without parole for that massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. ABC News' Gio Benitez has the latest from the foreman and reactions from the victims' families. Anger and disappointment after the jury recommended life in prison for Parkland gunman Nicholas Cruz rather than the death penalty. My firstborn daughter, my shining star, daddy's girl, was taken from me. Cruz showing little emotion. The families of the 17 victims also inside the courtroom, listening in disbelief as the judge read the verdict, some of them walking out. If this was not the most perfect death penalty case, then why do we have the death penalty at all? All 12 jurors would have had to agree to the death penalty, but the jury foreman saying three of them voted for life in prison. I didn't vote that way, so I'm not happy with how it, how it worked out. But everybody has the right to decide for themselves. Prosecutors had argued Cruz was a sociopath and that the massacre was premeditated. It was calculated. It was purposeful. But the defense said he was mentally ill, suffering from fetal alcohol syndrome after his mother abused alcohol and drugs during her pregnancy. He was doomed from the womb. And in a civilized, humane society, do we kill brain-damaged, mentally ill, broken people? I hope not. Did Joaquin get justice today? No, he did not. He did not.
In the midst of it all, Joaquin Oliver's father on the road working to bring awareness to gun violence. The day that I lost Joaquin, Joaquin did not lose me. So I, I got to keep on doing my parenting role. And the families will return to the courtroom on November 1st to deliver their victim impact statements. But no matter what, the judge is expected to formally sentence Cruz to life in prison. Diane. All right, Gio Benitez, thanks. Coming up, a regional Mexican music artist is redefining the genre, how she carries her family legacy when we return. Welcome back. The Grammys have declared her one of the regional Mexican music acts redefining the genre. Angela Aguilar is a teenage singer holding it down in a male-dominated industry carrying on her family's legacy. She sat down with Armorea Villarreal for this wide-ranging interview. Angela Aguilar is on top of the world. At just 19 years old, she's followed by millions of fans on social media. She's headlining a major tour with her famous ranchera family and even finds time to grow her brand, which includes her own doll. Yeah, I think you needed to a, a reminder if, if my um, doll with the Mexican flag and my brownness didn't tell you I'm very Mexican. Well, and what's really, really cool, I think, in general, is that just I see more younger girls feeling represented. And, and I think that me as a Mexican-American, as a woman, as a girl in this industry that's predominantly male and in this specifically Mexican music, it's mostly men. It's, it's amazing to be that woman, to be like, hey, like, I'm here and this is my doll and these are my dresses and this is Mexico and this is my tradition and this is my horse and this is my family and like, welcome to the show because it's, it's, it's going to be a cool ride. For Angela, that ride began back in 2003. Born in Los Angeles, ranchera music is in her blood. Her grandparents are Mexican-born actors and singers, Flor Silvestre and Antonio Aguilar. Her father and manager is singer-songwriter and producer Pepe Aguilar. His career as a ranchera singer spans more than five decades. He's won four Grammys, five Latin Grammys, and sold more than 12 million records worldwide. Early on, he began including his children in his performances. I started around when I was like three years old on stage. At three years old, Angela was enrolled in an opera conservatory, and by eight, she was recording her first album. For all those parents out there that are gonna watch this and say, at eight, you already had an album out. How, how does that even happen? Was this your idea? It's like a collective idea, you know, I, I wanted to sing, I wanted to be dressed like a princess, and I wanted to be able to be a part of my parents' shows and my dad's shows. Some people would say, I mean, you are a part of ranchera royalty, mm -hmm. and that can come with a lot of responsibility. How do you handle it? One day at a time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it's just, you know, I just try to handle it with the most respect I can and mm. and I ask for help and that's very important. I was that's also uncharacteristic of an 18 year old yeah. just so you know <laughs> that you need help. I know I'm not normal but like <laughs> <laughs> I ask for help my dad okay like my dad everything that I'm about to do he's already done and everywhere I'm about to play he's already played and every award that I've been nominated for he's already won so like it's just like dad what do I do? And dad's advice seems to be working because Angela's latest album is up for two Grammy nominations. It's filled with collaborations with some of her favorite artists and has two songs she wrote herself. You get to choose who you want to be. And my dad chose instead of, you know, drinking or parties or stuff, stuff like that, he chose his family and his music, you know? Um, being an artist is, is you, you're very alone when you're a singer because you sing for 15,000 people and then you come back to your hotel room and you're absolutely alone. And it's like that energy that you just received, like where, where are you going to put it? And he put it towards his family. The bond between Angela and her father is evident in her performances and success. 
Like my dad, what he would do is he would have like this microphone that had like this button called a talk back. And only me and my musicians and my engineers could hear what he was saying. Like the public couldn't hear it. So I would be on stage and he would be like, uh, you're off key. And then I would, oh. I would think about me being off key and I Wait, would fix it. Wait, while you're in the show? While I'm in the show. Those lessons now paying off in dividends. The family's latest creation, Jaripeo Sin Fronteras, on full display in stadiums across the country. This tour is something like I've never seen before. <laughs> you're riding a horse. Yeah. In a lot of your in a lot of your performance. Yeah. Who came up with this idea? My dad. He decided to do a horse show. And I don't think Anybody like realizes how hard it is to do a horse show? Oh, I think we all realize. Oh. <laughs> I would never do this job on a horse, just no, so you know. No, but it, not only because of the horse, because you need special permits for all of the arenas. You need to like bring in the dirt. We have hundreds of tons of dirt every single time we do a show. We have to bring in the dirt. You have we, to find dirt. Yeah. To bring in. To bring in, and then dirt is expensive. <laughs> I think that there's dirt everywhere. Uh uh. It's a different type of dirt. It's just a huge show. There's more than 150 people that you can see, plus everybody that's behind the scenes, like over 50 more. Yeah. So it's a huge show. And it's insane. It's like a Mexican circus. It's, 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 it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, Vicente, que en paz descanse, Vicente Fernandez, he gave me a horse. Don Vicente. Don Vicente. Uh, Don Vicente. Did you just talk about Chente? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, the Vicente Fernandez, the king of rancheras, gave Angela this horse. His name is Speedy because he's tiny and he's fast. Oh my God. <laughs> like <amazing>. Speedy Gonzalez. <laughs> Angela describes her genre as Mexican music with new age contemporary flair, unmistakable flair woven into classics like La Llorona. <laughs> or her Grammy-nominated Allí Donde Me Ven. How do you respond to those people, first of all, that say, you're not as traditional as we would expect for this kind of music? This is what speaks to my heart. And I'm not going to go up on stage just to sell, or I'm not going to go up on stage and sing a song just because it's what's expected of me. It's not going to sound truthful. It's not going to be from my heart, and you're not going to get the best of me. I love Mexican traditions in general. So, but I'm also 18, and I like Alicia Keys, and I, and I like Whitney Houston. By pushing the boundaries of tradition, Angela hopes she's opening doors for aspiring artists. I grew up to be a powerful woman. I am a proud feminist, and I am also a woman that thinks that um, I think music should speak by itself. And I think that we need more diversity in this industry. I think we need more people in places of power that are more open. I think what's important is what we all feel, which is the music, and where, you know, what really, really is our heart and our soul. Our thanks to Maria Virial for that report. And our thanks to you for joining us. I'm Diane Macedo. Do stay with us as ABC News Live continues with more news, context, and analysis. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.